All right, this is our second part for the judicial branch. Um, some of this is going to be a repeat of, of um, some of the ideas we started in the first part. A lot of this is we went over deeper and went, went over the judicial basics for the, the quiz um, here. First of all, how does a case make it to the Supreme Court? There are three paths. The most common pass, and the, and the first one that you have, is the writ of sedatari, in which the Supreme Court will have an appeal that they will decide to, to call up. Now, notice the direction where the Supreme Court is to hire one. They will ask for it to come up. In your writing, make sure that you emphasize, and there's this hierarchy. Now, how does it get there? Is there's this is where the appeal was done. You have our law clerks that will go through and their justices have instructed them to read through all these different appeals and there's certain things they're looking for. Like it, if, it's a, if it's a gun rights case, there's certain, certain test things that they want to look at um, to try to find it. And so then the law clerks find a case that they think might be, um, they present it with the justice. The justice will then go and present it when they have, have all nine justices together. Key point then, if four justices say they want to hear it, then that will go for the appeal. If not, the case isn't heard. Most appeals are never heard by the Supreme Court. There is only a small number. I have arbitrarily said like there's around 100, which usually is somewhere 80 to 130 cases in more recent years, so around 100 cases. This is where, where a vast majority of our cases are, but it's still only probably around 90 cases that we have. Here's one that we just recently had for the special election in Georgia, um, which was protested, but there were not four, four justices, so it's not heard, so the lower court ruling stands. And this is where the idea of jurisdiction um, comes in. All right, second path, the Popper's Papers. This is one for Gideon versus Wainwright is our example when going over that case. Um, this is where we know we have a system that's set up that does favor people with uh, more wealth but this gives a chance. A lot of times it is by people that are handwritten um, by federal prison. It doesn't have to be, but it does give a chance. So pauper, someone that, that is poor. Very few cases come through this way, but there are some. And again, Gideon versus Wainwright may be the most famous in time period. A small percentage, and I will say just rounding, say in 10 or so of the 100, are original jurisdiction. Now, we had this earlier um, with what the difference are. I know it's almost the exact same slide, just the word is a little bit different. But it's cases that involve a state, usually a state in a foreign country, two or more states, um, or between the federal government and, and a state. Um, again, there are, there are usually not a large number of this, but a key point to know is that the Supreme Court is both an appeals court and an original jurisdiction court. So where the district courts are original, the circuit courts of appeals are appeal courts, the Supreme Court is both. Once again, we have another chart, and this is where the hierarchy is very important. This is the third different diagram that I've had, but the Supreme Court being on top. Although most of these cases will go through from the district court to the appeals court um, that way. All right, how do you get heard? Um, here, and this is where I kind of explained it before of where you will have, again, you see the numbers there, seven to 10,000 that are appealed, the clerks going through um, in here. And this is why it's important if um, there, if you are a, a clerk that, or not important, but it is why you have a lot of job opportunities because you work for a few years, you're knowing what type of language and what, what different Supreme Court justices are looking for. So, so it is a, a good, good key to, for the future. Um, that conference of four uh, there, the rule of four um, there. No, remember the rule of three has nothing to do with this. That is with bureaucracies um, there. The, the term docket then, if it is, it is in heard, is put on the docket. All right, how are they actually heard? Most of it is writing, and this is where the writing that comes in, and there are documents and documents, and the Supreme Court justices will then review over these documents, and that's where those papers that, that come up. The appeals court are not, a, a, not about facts, okay? This is about um, process of the law and the Constitution. Now, there will be an oral argument that is given for a typical case. Um, and there, there is not a long time. Like, um, when we go to the Florida District Court of Appeals, it's only, it's only 20 minutes or half an hour for each side to speak. 
of there. And when they get their time to speak, the judges or justices for the Supreme Court can enter interrupt them, take away their time, ask them questions that maybe they weren't wanting to answer, but that is where they have to do it. Again, most of it's in the writing, but this is where. Sometimes you get an idea of what the justices are thinking with the questions that they ask, or if they're trying to point out something to another justice that, hey, what about this point of, that you have? All right, for I think about the fifth time in our notes, the phrase, the amicus briefs. Um, amicus briefs are when other people file things that agree or disagree with something that's um, in the courts. I've given the example before of if Duke Energy is to have a power plant at, in Crystal River and the Sierra Club protests against it and they file a lawsuit, the Friends of the Manatee Club may end up that follow, fi filing an amicus brief that, that agrees with them. Um, remember where we have for our Justice Department. The Attorney General is the top cop. Our top general that appears for the U.S. government is the Solicitor General um, in here. All right, two phrases you need to know, and these are both in our government basics. Precedent, that is what our whole basis of our courts are. When you go to, to law school, you learn about different precedents, and this is where the opinions are very important because that gives for, for the, the precedent. Pure curum decision are, there's nothing that has precedent, just solves the immediate case. This is actually what happens to probably 75, 80% of our cases um, that you have. That, that they, the Supreme Court makes a ruling, it's done. All right, it's not to be used for precedent um, that, that you have. The next thing that you have in here is stare decisis um, in here. Let the decision stand. Now, it upholds precedent of um, past cases. Um, it could be a past Supreme Court case that says we're still going to hold what, what we said said or the Supreme Court said in the past, or it may even uphold what was made by the appeals court um, in that case. But it's based on precedent, and that's a key thing to remember in here. Some other ones are brief orders, and it's simply this is where they are telling them, hey, look at this case again. What ends up happening is, again, the court system moves very slowly. So maybe while this was a pill, they, they had another case. So, hey, now your case fits with this case um, in here. You didn't really need to have the appeal. Um, may want to stop on this chart. This is actually a very good chart for kind of showing the basics of it. It is pretty straightforward on uh, for the judicial branch. Again, this is political science. But you must have, the, have and this is where, where we have the government basics, the vocabulary that you have. All right, the three different type of opinions that are written. All right, nine justices decide a case. If there are uh, five of them in the majority, that's the si side that wins. And then you will have either if the chief justice is there or the, the justice with the most tenure will help pick who writes the ma majority opinion. And they write and explain why. This is extremely important because this sets the precedent. Um, a lot of the cases don't. Again, only, only what, 10, 15, 20% of the cases each year actually have the opinions and of that even a smaller handful are really ones that are monumental um, that you have. Now there are times that there's someone that voted with the majority but disagrees with what the majority opinion um, justice wrote and they can write their own opinion. The dissenting opinions, the ones that were not on the majority decision, and you might say well why does that matter if they lose? Well they point out different things in law plus this is where for future appeals cases this is what they are saying that they're looking for. There are times that you have all nine justices that will each write their own, own opinion and either the majority, majority concurring or dissenting opinions that you have here. This is a case that we recently had, uh, kind of seen as an honor, her first um, oral argument that she was in, that, that then Amy Cohen Bear was able to write the, the, the opinion for this. Now, you know this is a 7-2 decision. I also was pointing out in here where we have the Sierra Club, the Environmental Protection Agency. So two of the three sides of, a, of an iron triangle are here, where we have an interest group with the Sierra Club, the Environmental Pe Protection Agency with the bureaucracy. And, for some, and then if for some reason or another we were to have a hearing on the same issue um, there, then we have the third side with a, with a con congressional committee. All right, judicial philosophy um, in there, where we went over with the basics, activism versus restraint, we'll have a little bit more about it. Here's where sometimes we'll go, and, and what has become a popular term is about originalist, and this is where the Federalist Society today, and where former Justice Anth Anth um, Scalia was famous for being um, for original intent. 
um, in here. And it's not just the Constitution to find out what did our founding fathers have. It could be, and get most famous, our Federalist Papers. But even like the term separation of church and state comes from the Danbury letter by Thomas Jefferson. So letters that they were writing to each other. The Northwest Ordinance, which was written before the Constitution, even going back to all these different things. Now, a major problem that we have with this is you you can read and you can have, dis, have different um, founding fathers that you can point to for something that is a modern issue. Um, and this is where a lot of times this is where the Second Amendment that, that we have and the ar argument that we have on both sides for original and there the idea of a militia um, there and, and the right to bear arms except for this is where some people say well the founding fathers had the idea of a militia um, therefore against the government there's others that will say that it was not meant for like the weapons that they have um, to be superior to the weapons so there are writings that you can get in both sides all right if you are an activist judge that does not mean you're liberal. That's one thing that Rush Limbaugh kind of put into the vocabulary. An activist judge is someone that is trying to use the courts for policy. An activist judge will overturn a lot of cases that were by lower judges and or they will also be ones that, that declare things that, that either the states or the U.S. Um, Congress made unconstitutional on um, there. So they are activists that they are doing something basically against more of what the people had voted for in this case. For restraint, this is where, the, the uh, for judicial restraint, which a lot of our history had this, the restraint idea is that you are going to only do things if you see it's truly unconstitutional. The Supreme Court to stay back, let, if people vote on things or Congress votes on things, that's where there should be more of that. And they usually will not overturn laws that are, are in the in the done that are passed by legislators again state or federal i mentioned that a lot of times people call them liberal activists but how can a conservative judge be considered activist and right now one of our most activist judges that we've ever had has been clarence thomas who is conservative and again if you are one that overturns what state legislators or the or the u.s congress had that's where you are activist because you are again going and using that as a check um, this is a chart, I know it's hard to see with, with this screen, but this is where the replacements and where they are and the idea of liberal and conservative. And you, but one thing you will notice is we have a, a huge divide um, along the way. Of course, one thing that's happened since this time is where Ginsburg has been replaced and then they would, be, it would jump up to there. So that's where we have a major change in the court. All right, on our court cases, you're gonna notice that most of them are going to deal with certain courts. We have the three cases of the Marshall Court of Madison, um, or Marbury versus Madison, McCollum versus Maryland, and Gideon versus Ogden. Those early ideas the Federalist Party had and the Federalist power incre increasing. Then we don't have as much activism by the court until we get to the Warren Court in the 50s and the 60s, seen as more liberal, but also this is where they will overturn a lot. The Burger Court has a lot of different cases. Um, they, are, they aren't really seen as liberal or conservative because they have some of both. The Rehnquist Court swings back more conservative on ideas. For history, one thing that you do need to know is, is the court packing um, scheme that was, that was tried in the 1930s by FDR. He did not like the idea that the Supreme Court had ruled a lot of his New Deal programs unconstitutional. Um, so what he tried to do was to increase the number of justices from 9 to 15. Remember, the, the Constitution does not say how many justices there have to be. Even though we've had um, 9 since 1868 as the most common number, that does not mean it has to be done. There is actually talk that that might be done in the near future also um, in here with Democrats that are, are looking to, to do this on um, there. But this is where he was going to increase it, where he could do the court. Congress would not go along with them. It kind of showed the, the more of the checks and balances and the ideas. Here's where for history, we kind of see where the difference between what happened with Hitler, where the German government kept giving Hitler more and more power, where for Roosevelt, when he was doing a power grab, the, the Congress will not allow for this, the Supreme Court. Now it did work for, for FDR in some ways because the Supreme Court, uh, after he tried this, was also a little bit more willing to work with them and let more things slide um, in here. And that's why I say, what did they do in response for it? And again, the belief in separation of powers, this is where checks and balances, separation of powers, this, this shows a lot of 
what certain groups were supposed to do. A lot of political cartoons that from the past for this. You see the fall in where the legislative and executive are marching one, judicial isn't going that way. Um, here's where it's supposed to be like almost like puppets for FDR that are saying yes, yes, yes. The old nine, the bench, but then six new Supreme Court justices. Impeachment in the court. We normally think of impeachment with the president, especially in recent years, but this is where you can have judges and justices impeached and they can be removed from the court. Uh, there. Most of the time when we have a federal judge that has an impeach, impeachment they, um, there or that, they're look, that the House is looking to do it, um, that they usually end up resigning uh, for it. But early on in our history, one, um, a very important thing happened historically. Samuel Chase, who was a Federalist and one of the last Federalists, was, in, was impeached by the House of Representatives that was controlled by Democratic Republicans. When the trial went to the Senate, just like all four of our impeachments for the president, they, they, Samuel Chase was not convicted, not removed from office. The reason why this is actually really important is if we would set a precedent that we would remove um, people from office just because we don't like their political stance, because he had not done what is required for impeachment, which was a high crime and misdemeanor against the United States bribery or treason. He just kept on making rulings that were what the, the Democratic Republicans didn't like. But the precedent that was set with this is the fact that the judges can be independent. And this is a, a key thing you're going to see that the, that the college board is about judicial independence that we have in here. All right, for the courts making policy, so we have activist policy, uh, activist courts. The Warren Court is usually the one that's given the example. The easiest case you can do is Brown versus Board of Education um, in here. But the courts can make the policy, but they can't enforce it. So in Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, when Orwell Falvis will not will will be calling the National Guard to stop the black students from coming into Central High School, then the the executive branch under Eisenhower will take over, and he'll actually switch and take over the National Guard to support them. Now the other side can be also be shown because because Andrew Jackson as president, when Congress had passed the Indian Removal Acts. And then it was declared unconstitutional um, in Worcester versus Georgia. Jackson wouldn't enforce it, and the Congress were agreeing with them. So you see here the courts, if they have both the executive and legislative against them, they can make a ruling, but they can't really enforce that policy um, in here. But this is where, again, this, that, that they can go and they can also help to enforce it. The example will be the, the civil rights in here. Key thing about it for implementation. Implementation is done by the bureaucracy, which the bureaucracy is by the executive branch. But you have the hearings and the funding coming from the legislative branch. There is no judicial bureaucracy. All right, the writ of mandis is another um, Latin term that we have, but this is where we can force a state government um, to do something. And this is with federalism, the supremacy clause um, that is done. All right, checks and balances. A lot of your writing will come with, and how checks and balances. I mentioned judicial independence, but they also have this um, there. So the main thing you have, and when you're writing about Supreme Court, you're going to write the word unconstitutional somewhere in there. But they can also have an injunction to stop a, an action, and that's with the lower court. So if, let's say, we're building a new nuke plant in Crystal River, and the Sierra Club has has filed a suit, the judge can actually stop at the building while they make the hearing. So that's where an injunction comes in here. If there's an impeachment of the president, normally the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court um, oversees it. That did not happen in our last one because Trump had already left office by the time they had the trial. So that is why that Justice Roberts didn't actually preside over it. Meanwhile, the president has the power to appoint the judges and justices, but the Senate has to approve. The president can also give a pardon or a reprieve to someone that the, that the Supreme Court or lower courts have that are convicted of a federal crime in here. Congress has the power to impeach and remove justices. The budget control is something that Congress also has. So again, the power of the purse um, in here. And if the Supreme Court declares something unconstitutional, Congress can propose a constitutional amendment. Now, it still has to be, be ratified by the states in here. All right. In recent years, we've um, here the there's there's a lot of questions on the on the judicial branch, but it only goes into a certain number of factors. We saw some of those with like the selection um, of justices and and all with and our last section of here. 
But judicial activism and restraint um, there and the path of the Supreme Court, the whole idea of precedent, sorry to see and um, that we have this, checks and balances building the Supreme Court in and here. What has been an, 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 a reoccurring theme is also the independence of the judicial branch, again, where they don't have to worry about being reelected uh, there. And so, yes, there are some checks and balances over them, but they, they, again, they can look and try to do what they believe is best for the future. Here you see a recent case, which again, TARDIS is the insulated from political influences. So that's that independence idea that, that you have um, there. They don't have to worry about public opinion. They're, the purpose of the lifetime terms is the fact that a justice can do what they believe is best for the country in the future, not what's, what's best for their next election, since they don't have to get election elected in here and um, that you have. The explain how each of the following can limit the in, independence of the Supreme Court. Again, think checks and balances um, for things that, that are, are done or the implementation of their policies that they have. Explain how the Supreme Court protects its political independence. Here's one that we have with the whole side of it. Starts out easy to find judicial review, but suddenly then we have a about the a deeper part of the checks and balances with the judicial re review and unconstitutional idea. Rid of sedentary, sorry decisions, judicial activism. So this is where a lot of those terms you see they're written on. Here's when it was more of the true essay that you would have. And once again, the idea that, that you have that um, they are, it's more of a judicial um, independence or staying away from public opinion again.